Today on The John Ankerberg Show, you will hear from three of the most well-known Christian apologists in the world. First is Ravi Zacharias, who grew up in India, where his ancestors belong to the highest caste of Hindu priests. One day, he heard the words of Jesus Christ and became a Christian. He went on to become one of the most brilliant Christian apologists in the world. He has traveled to more than 70 countries, speaking some of the most prestigious universities in the world, notably Harvard, Princeton, Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins, and Oxford University. Today, he will answer the question, can man live without God? Second is Dr. Stephen Meyer, who received his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge University and is the author of the best-selling book, Darwin's Doubt. He will tell why the Cambrian explosion of animals in the fossil record is leading many scientists to reject Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And third is Dr. William Lane Craig, who is considered by many to be the top Christian philosopher of our generation. He will tell why many scientists today believe that the extraordinary fine-tuning of the universe is the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. We invite you to join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program, I'm John Ankerberg. The purpose of our program is to present and defend the Christian faith. My guests are some of the most brilliant philosophers, scientists, historians, and scholars in the world today. And today, you're gonna to hear excerpts from three of the best. First, we'll begin with Ravi Zacharias. As you just heard, he has addressed more university students on more campuses around the world than anyone else. He is aware that across Western Europe, five in 10 people describe themselves as not religious or as convinced atheists. And in America, statistics reveal that about 70% of Christian young people who attend church regularly in high school will drop out or step away from their Christian faith when they start attending a non-Christian college or university. Why are they leaving behind the faith in which they were raised? Ravi Zacharias was invited to speak at Harvard to respond to the question, can modern man live without God? Here's part of what he had to say. I'd like you to listen. And Ravi, we're talking about can man live without God? If people choose to live as if God doesn't exist, there mm -hmm. are ramifications. Give us a summary of where we're at and let's continue. The question, that I think is uh, the reigning question of our time. All the others are really footnotes to this question. Can man live without God? My four points were that are actually a lot more. But if you take just these four that define our lives, I said the loss of a point of reference for moral absolutes, that you really are governing your own life by whatever your conscience tells you or what your intuition tells you. Now, the problem with that is in a world with so many different cultures, so many different religious perspectives, so many different forms of education, you're on a collision course at that point because what is good for one may be a cursed thing to another and vice versa. So we need to have a moral absolute that is objectively true for all of us. Is it objectively true to say I have no right to take a sword and lop off another person's head and do that with my own moral precepts and my own prerogatives and do it on display in public television and consider that a triumphalist thing. Is that morally right or wrong? What does our intuition say to us? Chances are somebody listening is going to say, you know, it's okay if it's revenge done by someone. Someone else is going to say, no, it's a horrific thing that you've done. What is the transcending point of reference to which we can point? Is it morally abhorrent to torture a baby for your own pleasure? And if so, where do we get that objective moral value from? So the fact of the matter is we need an objective standard by which we point. Scientifically speaking, you can't have your own law of gravity and I have my own law of gravity. You have your own law of thermodynamics and I have my own laws of thermodynamics. No, there are specific laws and precepts that are given. So it is in a moral universe, which is what this world is. So we need that objectivity. Secondly, the question of meaning. Now this becomes obviously more subjective, but not as readily as you may think so. Let me tell you why. Recently, 
a founder of an atheistic society against religion, passed away. As you and I are speaking right now, it just happened a few days before. And interestingly enough, she was an atheist, followed the Bertrand Russell dictum that when she was put into the soils, her body was going to rot. That's what prompted her daughter to make the statement that for my mother, because death is the end and the body rots, therefore life is precious. Now I found that fascinating. That's not what she was actually meaning. What she meant was her life was precious because she raised millions of dollars in the obliteration of other lives in the womb. And so I say, if you really think life is precious, what prompted you to fund the elimination of thousands of... Now, I know those are painful questions, but it is a legitimate question when somebody makes the statement that life is precious. So I believe life is precious, but I believe all of life is precious because all of life has intrinsic value, not extrinsic value given by government or state or culture. Now, the only way we can talk about intrinsic worth is if we are created by God himself, an entity of essential worth. Life can only have meaning and purpose if life has essential value and then has purpose and significance. So I think these two realities for the non-theist or the atheist or the anti-theist are really unanswerable questions. Oh, I know they try to answer them, that we have to live and let live. You've seen what tolerance has done in our time. What it really means is A's view is valuable, B's is dispensable. No, no. In a true world of tolerance and acceptance, we have to respect each other's views and dialogue on that meaningfully because life is meaningful. So I believe in knowing Jesus Christ, he who is my savior, who laid down his life for me and was willing to offer love and forgiveness for me who never even sought after him, but he pursued me, quote, like the hound of heaven. And there in that hospital bed, as I tried to take my life, found out that my life was meaningful, not because I was an A student or a B student or a C student, but my life was meaningful because I was a creature created imago Dei in the image of God. My moral reasoning and my essential worth comes to me from my creator. That alone enables me to pursue his purpose and his pattern and his design for my life. Yeah, Jesus Christ also gives us hope beyond the grave. And without Jesus Christ, you have no hope beyond the grave. Talk about that. Hope is something we all long for. And John, in Jesus Christ, this is the most beautiful thing about the gospel, the resurrection from the dead, the transformation of three lives, Thomas, who sees the risen Lord, ho kureosmu, ho theosmu, my Lord and my God, the transformation of Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul, who writes one third of the New Testament, and then the brother, his brother James. Hope beyond the grave redefines everything. Billy Graham was talking to Conrad Adenauer once. As Adenauer was looking out of the window, Dr. Graham told us the story around the table. And Dr. And Conrad Adenauer looked at him and said, Mr. Graham, do you really believe Jesus Christ rose again from the dead? And Billy Graham said, Mr. Adenauer, if I didn't, I would have no gospel to preach. He said there was silence. And then Conrad Adenauer said, you know, Mr. Graham, outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. I know when I die, I will be with him and also be with my loved ones who have known him and trusted him. Trust him where you are. He gives you hope not only for the future, hope for now, meaning for now, and the moral ground on which to define your life. Now each week our goal is to present to you the evidence for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the hope that this evidence will lead you into a personal relationship with Him in which you will experience the total forgiveness of your sins and the assurance that when you die, He's going to take you to heaven. And if you're a believer, I think that you realize that if you talk to non-Christians today about the Lord, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to answer some questions about science, such as, where did the universe come from? And how did life first arise on the earth? Well, today, most high school and college students around the world are taught that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution answers these questions and is an established fact of science 
rather than a theory. Students are not even aware that Darwin himself expressed doubts in The Origin of Species about his own theory's ability to explain a crucial piece of evidence in the fossil record. This evidence is known as the Cambrian Explosion, in which the first major groups of complex animals, they appeared abruptly, fully formed in the fossil record with no prior ancestors before them. Now, Dr. Stephen Meyer received his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge University. And in this next clip, he explains why nothing distressed Darwin more than the Cambrian explosion of fossils. I want you to listen. In 1859, this country estate, 30 miles south of London, was ground zero for a scientific revolution. Here in the solitude of his study, Charles Darwin completed his landmark book on the origin of species. In it, Darwin attempted to explain how every organism that had ever lived evolved from a single common ancestor as a result of natural selection acting on random variations. Common descent and natural selection became the twin pillars of modern biology and Darwin's branching tree of life, its foremost icon. Yet despite the clarity and detail of his argument, Darwin acknowledged a problem that defied explanation, the Cambrian fossil record. The distinctness of specific forms and their not being blended together by innumerable transitional links is a very obvious difficulty. I allude to the manner in which species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. When Darwin was writing The Origin of Species, it was well known at the time that the first fossils of animals appeared suddenly without precursors in the geological record. So there was a deep conflict between what his theory told him to expect to find, namely an abundance of transitional forms going back to that common ancestor for the animals, versus what was there in the fossil record. Darwin knew that if his theory was true, the older rock strata directly beneath the Cambrian layer should reveal a progression of fossils connecting simple earlier forms to complex animals like trilobites through a trail of incremental steps and failed biological experiments. Such evidence would document the trial and error process of natural selection. But Darwin says in the origin, where are these transitional forms? They're not there in the fossil record. What we see instead are fully formed, discrete groups. Now that's a world-class puzzle for someone like Darwin. If my theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed. And during these periods of time, the world swarmed with living creatures. To the question of why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earlier periods prior to the Cambrian, I can give no satisfactory answer. Dr. Meyer, why were these fossils in the Burgess Shale so challenging to Darwin's theory of evolution? Well, the fossils of the Burgess Shale, as well as all the other Cambrian uh, fossil beds that have been discovered, raise two mysteries. Uh, create two mysteries for, for Darwin's uh, theory, and they were the source of his doubt about the ability of his theory to explain the, the whole of the evidence. And the first mystery I call the mystery of the missing fossils, and the, the film clip there documents it very well, that you have the first major complex animal forms arising in the Cambrian, and as you look in the lower pre-Cambrian strata, you don't find the the ancestral precursors to those fossils that you would expect to find if Darwin's picture of the history of life is true. And the second mystery is closely related to it, and I call this the mystery of how you build an animal. Uh, how would the evolutionary process build an animal? According to Darwin, the process by which complex animal life arose was the process of natural selection acting on small incremental variations. And Darwin uh, understood that the, the variations would need to be small and incremental because if there was a large change in, uh, in the form of an animal from one generation to the next, that would be something like a birth defect or a deformity. And he understood that those kind of uh, gross changes would always be deleterious or detrimental. So instead, the changes that would occur from generation to generation that would be the source of 
the evolutionary change over time had to be very small and incremental, which meant that the process needed to take a great deal of time. And instead, what we see in the fossil record is this abrupt appearance without the ancestors and without any evidence of that slow, gradual trial and error process having occurred over time. So the Cambrian explosion raises two mysteries, the mystery of the missing fossils and the mystery of, uh, of what is the process by which all this complexity uh, came about. Now, this evidence of the abrupt appearance of complex, fully formed animals in the Cambrian explosion points to an all-powerful God who created and designed life. But there is much more evidence that points to God's existence. More and more scientists today believe that the extraordinary fine-tuning of the universe is the most powerful evidence for the existence of God to ever come out of science. Philosopher Dr. William Lane Craig explains why in this next clip. I'd like you to listen. I want to get to the second reason for the existence of God. As you say, the complex order in the universe points to an intelligent designer. Explain. Scientists once thought that whatever the initial conditions of the universe might have been, given enough time and a little luck, eventually intelligent life forms like ourselves would evolve. But instead, during the last 50 years or so, scientists have discovered to their surprise that the existence of intelligent life in this universe depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions given in the Big Bang itself. In fact, it appears that the universe has been incredibly fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life from the very moment of its inception. And this fine-tuning is beyond comprehension in its delicacy. To give you an idea of the delicacy of the fine-tuning, let me just give a couple of numbers yeah. to give you a feel for the odds. The number of seconds in the entire history of the universe, all the way back to the Big Bang, is about 10 to the 18th power. 10 to the 18th power seconds in the entire history of the universe. 10 followed by 18 zeros, a huge number. The number of subatomic particles in the entire known universe is said to be around 10 to the 80th power. Now, with those numbers in mind, consider the following. In order for the universe to be life permitting, the force of gravity and the weak force in the atom have to be fine tuned to the precision of one part out of 10 to the 100th power. The cosmological constant that governs the accelerating expansion of the universe is fine tuned to one part out of 10 to the 120th power. Here's a real eye popper. Roger Penrose of Oxford University has estimated that the odds of the initial low entropy state of the early universe obtaining by chance alone is one chance out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123, a number which is so incomprehensible that to call it astronomical would be a wild understatement. And the examples of fine tuning are so diverse and so numerous that they are unlikely to disappear with any future advance of physics. The fine tuning is here to stay and requires some sort of explanation of its existence. And in the literature on this subject, there are basically three possible explanations that are put forward. One would be physical necessity, that it's, it's due to the laws of nature. They have to have the values they do. Second would be it's just pure chance alone. The third one would be it's the product of intelligent design. Someone has designed the universe to be life permitting. The problem is that those first two alternative explanations, physical necessity and chance, are just not very plausible. There's nothing about the laws of nature that require these constants and quantities to have the values they do, and the chances are so remote that they cannot be reasonably faced. So that I think the most rational explanation is intelligent design. And a number of scientists have said this as well. For example, Paul Davies, a prominent physicist, has said, through my scientific work, I have come to believe more and more strongly that the physical universe is put together with an ingenuity so astonishing 
that I cannot accept it merely as a brute fact. And Robert Jastrow, who was the head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, has said that this is the most powerful evidence for the existence of God ever to come out of science. So we can summarize this first argument as follows. One, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a cause of its beginning. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause of its beginning. We can summarize this second argument as follows. One, the fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. Now, folks, I believe that God has placed evidence about himself all around us. And if you are willing to examine it, I believe it will lead you to the conclusion that God exists. Now, each week we introduce you to some of the most brilliant Christian scholars in the world to help you understand and defend biblical truth and to know the gospel. And did you know that we are broadcasting these programs on eight foreign language networks overseas? Besides English, we're broadcasting in Russian, Ukrainian, Romanian, in Hindi, Telugu, and Tamil, and in Hebrew and Spanish. And the response has been amazing. Last January, in just 30 days, we were able to reach over 2 million people on Facebook. In April, that number grew to over 4.5 million people. And last month, we were able to reach 8.1 million people. And I want to tell you about one man who responded who really touched my heart. He lives in Pakistan where 95% of the 195 million people in that nation practice Islam. Hindus make up about 2% of the nation and Christians only about 1%. This man wrote, I'm from Pakistan and belong to the Hindu religion, but I'm interested in learning about Christianity. I'm writing this email to you in the hope that you will send me some basic teachings about the Christian religion so I can learn how Christianity is different from other religions. Our staff quickly sent him information and in a few days he wrote back and he said, I want to thank you for your help in sending me such a wonderful teaching about how to become a Christian on video and including some written material which really helped me to understand how to become Christian. I have great pleasure to share with you that I just prayed the prayer below after learning it. Here's the prayer, Dear Lord Jesus, I admit to you that I have sinned. I know that I cannot save myself. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe that your death was for me and I receive your sacrifice on my behalf. As best as I can, I now transfer all of my trust from myself and anything that I would do to you. I open the door to my life to you. By faith, I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Amen. He went on to say, this prayer changed my life since I've been feeling such a joy to receive Jesus in my life. I'm thankful to God for his leading and making me free from my sins. I need your prayers for me as I want to share this teaching with my wife so she also can come to receive Jesus in her life and get eternal life. A few days later, he wrote back and he told us his wife had also received Jesus as her savior. Folks, this man illustrates why I need your help. I believe there are millions of others just like him who are searching for Jesus, and I need your help to reach them. But with millions of people already interacting with us each month, I need your help right away. If we can raise $700,000 this month, I believe we'll be able to reach over 20 million people online presenting and defending the gospel. And our goal is to see 1 million people accept Christ and enter into our discipleship program. So could I ask you to consider giving some size gift to help us? If you'll give a gift of $100 or more to help as a thank you, you may choose any one of three special television packages that our staff has put together. First is our new Prophecy Package, which features eight TV series and contains 32 programs, including our series, Israel Under Fire, World Events and Biblical Prophecy, 13 scholars answer tough questions about the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming, the Middle East and the last days, step-by-step -step through the rapture, step-by-step -step through the book of Daniel with Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, and the coming economic crisis and the financial signs of the end times with Dr. David Jeremiah. Then second is our new science package, which features eight TV series, 
and contains 33 programs, including The Mystery of the Missing Fossils, The Case for Intelligent Design, and The Four Great Discoveries of Science, all with philosopher of science, Dr. Stephen Meyer. Also, what scientific evidence proves God created and designed the universe? Step by step through creation, science discovers the universe had a beginning. Can the biblical account of creation be reconciled with scientific evidence? Why is the Big Bang evidence that God created the universe? All of these with astronomer Dr. Hugh Ross. Then our third package is God's Encouragement. It features eight TV series and contains 30 programs, including how you can be sure that you will spend eternity with God and hope for those who doubt with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, so you don't fall away from the faith with Dr. Daryl Bach, dealing with doubt featuring Dr. Gary Habermas, God's help when you suffer, God's comfort when you are discouraged, depressed, and fear the future, and how God can help you deal with chronic pain, disability, and illness. All of these programs with Johnny Erickson Tata and Dr. Michael Easley. And finally, God's encouragement for today's Christian. This is a sermon I preached at Dr. David Jeremiah's church. Today, if you'll give a gift of $100 to help us, you may choose any one of these three packages or request all three for $300. And if you're able to give a gift of $1,000 or $100,000, I hope that you will do so. If you can only send a gift of $25, I'll be glad to send you our three programs with Johnny Erickson Tata and Dr. Michael Easley entitled, God's Help When You Suffer. Folks, I'm asking you if you'd be willing to partner with me in reaching out to millions of people in over 200 countries. If you'll help me, I'll also send you our monthly report of what God is doing. So please call us right now at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. You may also call that same number any day this week, or if you wish, you may also go to our website at Show. Dot org, where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. I'll appreciate your help very much. to learn how to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, go to our website at jashow.org and click on Pray to Accept Jesus Christ as Your Savior.